Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast, your source for beekeeping news, information, and entertainment. I'm Jeff Ott. And I'm Kim Flottam. Well, I'm really looking forward to this uh, in the podcast today, Kim. Uh, ever since you gave me the book that you and Marina wrote and I've uh, sat down and read it, it's, uh, it's a great read. So this will be a fun podcast. Yeah, I think so. I've, uh, we've been trying to get Marina on here and our schedule's finally uh, hooked up so that uh, we can all three of us sit down at the same time. Marina and I go back uh, not quite 20 years. Uh, she started doing some writing for us. And then we ran into each other at the National Honey Show in London one year. I think it was 2003, and we were the only two Americans there, or three Americans. Kathy was with us. Uh, so that was that was kind of neat. But after that, we uh, ran into each other again in, in Connecticut. She was president of the Backyard Beekeepers out there, and they were honoring a guy named Ed Weiss, who was the founder of, oh, yeah. of that group. And Ed and I had known each other when I was living in Connecticut, so I got out there and Marina and I, again, kind of put our heads together and she got to talking about honey and I'm a plant person and it just kind of fell together. Uh, you know, what, what honey do plants make and what, what plants make what kind of honey and uh, she put together kind of a proposal and I tweaked it and we went to a publisher and a year later the Honey Connoisseur showed up. So uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to talking to her because she's taken this thing a whole lot further than the book that we did together. It's, uh, I've enjoyed watching what she's doing. Ed Weiss, The Queen and I, is one of my first books I read about beekeeping. So yes, it's yes. A great book. Well, that's great. Let's, uh, let's give uh, Marina a call and uh, get this going. Hello. Hi. How you doing, Marina? Thanks for joining I'm good. us. Good, nice to meet you. Yeah, yeah, thank you for having me. Very excited and nice to hear from Kim again. Well, it's nice to be able to uh, chat again, Marina. We uh, we go back and forth, and I'm just going to be just just uh, a brazen commercial here. I will tell our listeners that in the December issue of Bee Culture Magazine, that's December 2018, uh, we have two articles about you. Uh, we've been able to hook up. We've been, our schedules have worked that we've got two articles. We couldn't talk to each other for four years, but we finally got together <laughs> two articles. We've got one on uh, that, that Marina wrote uh, on, on pairing honey with cheeses. And you're going to tell us a whole lot more about that in a minute. And then because December is our interview issue, I figured, well, what a perfect opportunity. I'm going to interview my co-author. So we've got a little bit more about your book in the December issue, but I hope that you're going to tell us a lot more uh, today. So uh, just so people know, you are the person in charge of Red Bee Honey, and you are the person working with the American uh, Honey Tasting Society. And I'm going to bet you've got your fingers and other things that you're going to tell us about. So Start with the American Honey Tasting Society, I think, or is there a better place to start on this story, Marina? Well, Kim, thank you for having me on the show. I'm really excited to sit down and talk with you and uh, tell you about uh, what I've been doing with honey. So let's back up a little bit. Um, during the time we were doing the book, um, I actually was going back and forth to Italy to take the honey classes there. They have honey school. And uh, it was about two, three years that it took me to complete the whole program. But essentially what they have is honey school there. And they teach you basically how to taste honey and they train you on all the sensory um, applications and the methods to tasting honey and, and to identify floral sources. So it was really exciting to see what they've done over the last 30 years in Italy with honey. And the American Honey Tasting Society is actually a partnership with uh, one of my teachers. And we've been bringing that information and that education here to the U.S. to teach people about honey. This sounds something like, um, I, I, I'm not a taster by any stretch, but this sounds something like the olive oil and the wine people do. Is this similar? It's very similar. The methods and the training that they use for olive oil and wine, of course, um, is very, very similar. They teach you about um, taking notes and to, uh, you know, visually and then to do all kinds of um, 
evaluation. So you're going to evaluate the color of the honey, the smell, the flavor, the intensity, and you take notes and you learn how to identify different honeys by all of these different sensory characteristics. Well, I know I've done just enough of it and I've watched you teach enough classes that I, I kind of have a feel for how it works, but um, uh, give me, give me a, give me a, or give us a, a, a quick run of, I, okay, you just took a taste of honey or you're going to take a taste of honey, take a taste of honey and then tell me what you do to describe that honey. You know so what I mean? It's, yeah. So basically um, you're, you're going to evaluate the honey through all of the sensory characteristics. So when I, when I have a sample of honey, and a matter of fact, today, I just got three samples of honey from somebody in Indonesia hmm. that asked me to do evaluations on the honey. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to take that honey and I'm going to put it in a bowl glass, something where I can really look at the color and I can really stick my nose in there and smell the honey so I'll put them in the glasses and then uh, I have note paper, um, like an evaluation sheet where I will sit there and I will evaluate the color. I will smell the honey. I will do evaluations using the honey aroma and flavor wheel from our book. Excuse me. Do, I do, will. How much honey are you looking at? Is, are you, when you say you put it in a glass, are you looking at a, a, a cup, a, a quarter cup? No. Usually about two teaspoons, oh, really? two tablespoons. Yeah, just enough so that you can smear it around the bowl and really stick your nose in there and smell it. Hmm. So I use the honey aroma wheel with all of these descriptors. So I will smell the honey and then I will start to write my notes. What are my impressions of that honey? Is it floral? Is it grassy? Is it, um, you know, earthy? Do I smell cedar in there? Do I smell camphor? So I'll do my uh, smell evaluations and I will take notes. The next thing I'll do is I'll take a spoon and I will put it in my mouth and then I will do the taste evaluation, which is similar. You'll use the same kind of descriptors that are on the honey wheel. And I will take my evaluation notes of what I'm tasting. Then if the honey is liquid or crystallized, uh, we'll do some evaluations on the texture of the honey and the crystal. So are the crystals large? Are they small? Are they coarse? Are they grainy? Are they like cat's tongue? So there's evaluations of, is it like sandpaper? I was going to say, <laughs> so, I've never put a cat's tongue in my mouth. I don't know what that would, t- well, what that would feel well, like. You, <laughs> if you've ever had a cat, like a cat lick your uh, oh, fingers. Oh, 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 okay, okay, okay. That kind of a uh, tactile feel. Okay. So you can evaluate the quality of the crystals, which uh, we've been t- trained to do. So in the evaluation sheet, I will fill out all of those qualities, all the sensory characteristics. And then for me personally, what I like to do is uh, let it go and then come back a couple days later or come back a couple more times because there will always be something new that you may smell or taste uh, that you didn't on the first time around. So I will basically just write up uh, a sensory profile sheet uh, over, I like to do it over like two weeks or something because the truth is, is that When you're tasting honey, some days you may be a little fatigued, you might be tired, you might have a little sinus um, infection or or something, or it it might be very humid or very hot. So your environment and your physical condition can really affect what you taste and how you taste that day. So I like to come back and I like to try to taste it over and smell it over. And then if if there happens to be somebody around, like a friend or a customer, I might ask them to taste the honey and see what their impressions are because you can always learn from tasting with a group of people or, or other people. You'll always learn something and you may always uh, taste or smell something really different. I wonder, Marina, this is getting complicated fast. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but but okay, you've got a sample of honey in your in your glass, and it and you you you've been working with it for how long does this take when you do this? A half hour? It could. Um, mm-hmm. I really take my time and I really concentrate. And when I do it, I'm usually alone in a room 
where there's no distractions, there's no other smells, um, you know, like no cooking or something, because all of those other kind of distractions can take away from your concentration. Well, not only that, I'm wondering if being in that glass for 10 minutes or 15 minutes or 20 minutes, uh, some of the volatiles are escaping and, and you're losing some of that? Absolutely. So when I have it, they're covered. So is, oh, is it a regular, okay. like a fruit glass or is it like a brandy sniffer where, where you can? I, well, we use uh, wine glasses. So mm-hmm. like a small red wine glass. Actually, um, I got them from Ikea. I really love them. They're round bowls. I'm sorry. So we don't that... do, we don't do commercials here. Oh, oh I'm, sorry. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so yeah i mean it's basically a red wine glass um you can do it with maybe a small tumbler Mm -hmm. um really it should be glass and yes they're capped the 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 glasses are capped with um it can be just a plastic cup or something really to keep the volatiles in so you know i'll kind of flip it open and stick my nose in and close Mm -hmm. it again and i'll do all kinds of funky little techniques to smell the honey, um, pinch my nose when it's in my mouth and then unpinch your nose. So there's all kinds of little techniques that people can develop that can really help them to identify and, and, you know, smell and taste different, um, you know, sensations. I have the advantage here of I'm looking at, at your flavor wheel, your aroma and tasting wheel. And, and I'm looking at words like, like, like citrus and burned and caramel and nut and lactic. And there's, there's I don't know, 25 or 30 words here that you're using to describe honey. And I can see where your vocabulary really, really has to expand. But how do I learn what lactic tastes like? That's a great question. So you have to come to the American Honey Tasting Society. <laughs> okay. Class. Good, okay. Well, that's so, good. So the class is really um, are a, a, a series of exercises, sensory exercises that help you to really um, open up your senses, open up your mind, and get you to start talking about honey using different descriptors. So we do have an exercise which is called standard odors, and they're these little cups that are these, pre- are these are your classes in Italy that you're doing this or these are what you're doing or this is where you learn to do this? Well, this is where we I learned in Italy through this exercise called Standard Odors. And we do it here for the American Honey Tasting Society. So it's essentially uh, little cups of standard odors that we pass around and everybody in the class will smell them and they have to identify it. So, for example, we may pass one of the little cups around. You don't know what it is. You smell it and you have to self-test, meaning uh, you you will try to identify that. Um, And everybody will go around the room and smell that one cup. And then we'll say at the end of the exercise, what was number two? What was number one? And the class will say what they thought it was. So some people might be able to identify lemon or lactic. And then if not, we kind of talk about it. So... If they a lot, one of the things that I see very common in class is that if we have people smelling lavender or rosemary, they're very, very similar. You're a plant guy, you know that lavender and and rosemary can be very similar because of the camphorous smell that it has. So sometimes people will mix them up and then we'll talk about it. What is the difference between lavender and rosemary so that they can understand the different qualities. So the next time, if you're tasting a honey and you come across lavender or rosemary, you'll be able to tell the difference. So it kind of, it gets down to nitpicking um, and, and really honing in on what that you're tasting and smelling because it's really important because if you're tasting 10 honeys, and one honey or, or three honeys have this camphorous uh, aroma or taste, you want to be able to, to really pinpoint, is this honey a camphorous rosemary or this is a lavender or this is a lemon? Because that's going to be stuck in your memory. And the next time that honey comes along, you'll be able to tell 
honey A from honey B. And that was one of the things that we did in class in Italy. After the four days, we had a blind test, 12 different honeys, and they let us use our notes, but you really have to hone in the differences between the different flavors and start to memorize. So it's, it's very similar to wine training. And I have to tell you that it's a lot of fun to challenge yourself in class and to, to, um, you know, have conversations with other tasters in the room, other students, and really to kind of make yourself a, a better taster. Then in the end, what happens is, is that when you cook or you go into your garden and you start picking herbs and flowers, you start smelling things and start describing it, but it makes you a better cook in the end as well. Hmm. The difference between buckwheat and clover is obvious. I mean, the strong, yes. heavy, and the light, fragrant. But when you were talking about this camphor, and, and A, I'd have to learn what camphor smelled like. <laughs> well, smelled you're a plant like, guy. You know lavender <laughs> and... I, I, okay, I can, I, can, I can see that. I, I mean, I can see, okay, I know what lavender smells like. Using the word camphorous to describe that wouldn't, it isn't at the top of my list. I would have to learn that that's what the smell is so I can convey that information to other people and they would understand what I was talking about because they too would know camphor. But between those two camphorous honeys that you just described, um, how many times do you have to do that to learn that very subtle difference? Practice makes perfect. And, <laughs> and I, I will say honestly that after I took the three years of classes in Italy, what I found is that between class one and two, when, when we came back for the second class, that some of the people had practiced and done their homework and um, practiced tasting honey and practiced uh, reading their notes and, you know, using those descriptive words um, and some people did not, but it's really practice makes perfect. And um, you don't take the class and finish and then think that you're done. I think it's an ongoing, um, you know, it's an ongoing education and you do have to practice a lot and taste different honeys and, and pay attention and concentrate and write notes. And for me, Honestly, I feel that I have the luxury of running Red Bee Honey, and as it's grown, I'm buying and selling honey. I'm meeting beekeepers, and um, you know, tasting a lot of samples over the last 15 years. I've had this luck that this luxury to be able to constantly have honey in my life on a regular basis. So I feel that I get to practice a lot. Well, knowing knowing. Jeff, you gotta, you gotta. Here's a thought. <laughs> uh, okay, when I when I started beekeeping 40 years ago, I was tasting honey, and I know that I'm not the same person I was 40 years ago. My body has changed. My my ability to describe has increased, but my body's ability to discern differences has probably evolved. How's that for for a slinky term? So <laughs> I'm not. You know, my ability to taste those differences now is probably going to be different than it was some time ago. Do you see that happening? Not maybe with yourself, but is that a, is that a, does that happen to people? Is that, I, as I get older, I get worse. How's that? No, absolutely. <laughs> you know, when, when I, when I teach class and when I was at EAS in 2007 and I did my three hour uh, honey tasting, we had a group of 30 people. And let me tell you, as we do the exercises and people are using the wheel and, and learning the vocabulary and how to talk about it with a guided teacher, you see them pick it up very quickly. It's just a matter of laying down the methods and showing them. And it's so much fun because as you're teaching, you see people pick up the language and the lingo and they get really clear about what they're smelling and tasting. It's just a matter of really showing people the exercises and doing it with them. And a lot of people have asked me to do this for them online or over Skype, but it's very, very difficult 
to do the exercises unless you're really in person. But people pick up and they get better. And it's it's not difficult. It's just showing people the method and learning how to do the evaluations and then just the lingo and practice makes perfect. Once you learn it, you can go home and you can self-practice. You can have any single honey sample anywhere and you can do your own evaluations and keep your notes. Um, and you just learn as you go along and it's a lot of fun. So let's, let's step through that real quick. I mean, so, so our listeners saying, Hey, I got a jar of honey that I got from the hive this week or this fall and it's great. And I want to go step through it. So just Without going through the entire course, just how how would they do that? How do they prep themselves? How do they uh, prepare their mouth? How do they, they you, you've already described the glass, just step through just the, the initial tasting. And how, how, do, how do you recommend someone just getting started to, to experience this in a different light, as opposed to just throwing it on a piece of bread and butter and into their mouth? Well, I think... I think, you know, beekeepers that are interested in having a conversation with their customers or the chefs and these restaurants that are starting to really look at local honey and having it on the menu, I think it's it's very helpful to have this conversation mm -hmm. because you can say, you know, here's my spring honey, here's my fall honey, here's my summer honey, and at the farmer's market, you know, a customer will come and say, well, what's the difference between those honeys? And it's really helpful for the beekeeper to be able to have a conversation to say, well, my light honey is, you know, um, fruity and tropical fruits and a little bit of, um, you know, mustiness to it. And my darker fall honey is, you know, a little bit more caramelly with cocoa notes or something. So it, it's really helpful for them to market their honey mm -hmm. and have these conversations with customers and even to post it on their website because um, I do a lot of research on the internet and I see some really fabulous honeys and I look at the website and I say, well, what does it taste like? <laughs> <laughs> it looks so delicious, but what does it really taste like? So um, I think it's very helpful to everybody beekeepers and and chefs and people cooking and using honey and recipes to be able to have the conversation and elevate honey to uh, a higher you know level for respect rather than you know thinking that all honey is the same how do so how does one take that first taste of of honey to to really taste it in a different in a different approach to honey you, you take a big spoonful, a little spoonful. Do you swirl it on your tongue? I think it's a whole, it's a whole sensory process. It's mm -hmm. looking at the color. It's the smelling it. It's evaluating the intensity. Is it a very strong smell? Is it a very uh, delicate smell? And then the taste, I think putting it on the tongue, um, you know, and then there's the hedonistic which is I like it or I don't like it. But one of the things that I should mention is when we're doing this evaluation and we're teaching, everything is objective. It's not I like or I don't like. We taste the honey like buckwheat. And if we say buckwheat smells like horse barn, it <laughs> smells like horse barn. It's not I don't like buckwheat honey or I don't like horse barn. It smells what it is. So all of our evaluations are objective. So when you put a okay, I, I like your question, Jeff, um, and 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 so the people who are listening to this. All right, you're going to close your eyes and you're going to imagine you're seeing this. Okay, I've got a tablespoon, a teaspoon, a half a teaspoon, uh, a dipping stick, and take me from there. For me, to taste honey is a whole. It's the whole evaluation. It's not just put it in my mouth. I really like look at the color, I smell it, I taste it. And for me, when I taste it, I like to put a big spoonful on my mouth, let it roll on my tongue and inhale. And then I would start thinking about what do I taste? What do I smell? And if it's on the wheel or if it's not on the wheel, because the wheel's not every single descriptor that you're ever going to taste on honey. It's just really a tool to start jogging your memory to, you know, find, pick out some of the finer points, but basically you're tasting it and you're trying to pull out of your own memory. What, what are you tasting? What, what is there? Is it 
um, you know, cinnamon? Is it baked bread? Is it cough syrup? Is it wet wool? I mean, there's all different types of honeys from around the world and you're going to come up with so many different descriptors and you can use your own. You could make up your own because tasting is very personal. I'm afraid it, as, as technical as I ever get is vintage 2018. <laughs> <laughs> Fresh is the best. Fresh is the best. Um, and, and, and after that, it's, well, it's, you know, um, that's a, it's 2018. You like it or you don't. So, well, um, uh, uh, so, so you're doing these on your own at American, the American Honey Tasting Society um, around the East Coast, I know. Connecticut and New York City and things, but let's take this the next step because, uh, like I said earlier, we we did this article. You did this article this month on pairing honeys with cheese, and I know you pair them with a lot of other things, just like people pair wines with certain foods. Uh, pair some honeys with me on on, <laughs> on what's good. So right before you uh, called, I was thinking about honeys pairing with different dishes for Thanksgiving, like pumpkin pie or squash soup or honey mustard for Brussels sprouts or honey butter. So I was thinking about all the different honeys that I am familiar with and what they would go with for Thanksgiving. But one of the things that surprised me um, in Italy and, and in other countries is that honey is not used really in tea the way we do here. Everybody, you know, puts a spoon at honey in their tea for sore throat. But what they do is they use it on different foods and primarily cheese because when you're tasting or pairing honeys with cheeses, you're tasting the full flavor of the cheese and then you're also getting the full flavor of the honey. And they marry them together. And uh, this way you're getting the full flavor. You're really getting to taste the honey rather than just dissolving it in tea or uh, cooking it away in bread or something. So I started working with Murray's Cheese, which is in New York City, uh, about 10 years ago. They started buying some of my honeys and uh, some honeycomb. And the other thing that they do there, besides sell wonderful food and cheeses, is they do classes. So I was invited to be an instructor for a honey and cheese class. Uh, about 10 years ago. So in their classroom, they have about 30 people. And before the class, what we do is we sit down and we taste about six different honeys and then we pair them up with cheeses. So the cheese mongers are the experts on the cheese. And over the years, I've really learned a lot about cheese. It's as diverse as honey or wine or olive oil. So that also helped me to really become a better taster is to sit down with these cheese people and taste a lot of cheeses and talk about it. So we would pick out the flavors and the smells in the cheeses, and then we would kind of taste the honeys. And then we would pick out the smells and the flavors of the honeys and try to complement them. Uh, sometimes we would contrast them and other times um, we would hopefully that the two became th a third flavor. So over the years, I've done these classes with Murray's and it's been a lot of fun because I'm not only I'm learning about tasting, I'm learning about cheeses. And then as we do the presentation for the people who come to the classes, we, we leave it very informal. So we have conversations and we ask them, well, what are you tasting? What are you smelling? What do you like? What didn't you like? And this kind of conversation and interaction with people really um, helps you learn a lot more about the process and, and the products. Hmm. Well, I can see where it adds another dimension, certainly to to honey. But do the cheese people have similar vocabulary, similar process in tasting honey or tasting cheeses? Yeah, I mean the human, you know, the tongue can taste just a, a handful of um, you know different sensory qualities, like on the wheel. So yeah, they have grassy, they have earthy, musty, they have honeys that are 
you know, uh, wrapped in, in la- lavender leaves or cocoa rubbed with coffee. So yes, the, 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 the vocabulary that you use can cross from cheese to honey. Um, and you know, it's all part of the learning of the tasting process. It becomes a three dimensional description when you're tasting the yeah. two together. <laughs> and, and so, so what's the best honey to go with Swiss cheese? <laughs> well, it's, this, you know, that's a trick question because, you know, everybody there, there's, you know, everybody's uh, preferences are going to be different, but you know, we, we would pick out something that was in season or readily available. So, I mean, I would probably do, it really depends on that particular cheese, like honey, you might say, well, this is a, a, a Linden honey, but every season it's a little different. So with cheeses, you have that aspect of terroir where it's going to be different. So it gets really complicated. And it also, <laughs> well, also it. depends on whether it's Craft or Sargento or uh, the local uh, deli Swiss cheese, I'm sure. <laughs> exactly. So, so ter- <clears throat> you just mentioned the magic word here, and this was the word that I learned when we put this book, our book together, was terrar, and and explain that to to our listeners because it's it's not something most people are have, are familiar with. I think. So it's a word. That it's a French word. It's really used a lot with wine, and it's a concept that has to do with the fact that wine, grapes, or any kind of uh, product of nature, food of nature, like honey, uh, the, the qualities will change depending on the floral source, depending on the climate, the region, the soil, the humidity, the, the rainfall, the slope of the hill, or the, or the geography of the land. And we know that as beekeepers, that our honey will change season to season, depending upon what's blooming in the weather. So this word terroirs is just a, a general word that is used for wine mostly. Um, but early on as a beekeeper, I started to see the parallel between honey and wine. And this concept of terroir really applies to honey in so many ways. So um, I, I think that you know, matching, going back to matching the cheese to the honey, you almost have to really taste that production of that cheese and where that cheese was from and how that cheese maker produced it to see what honey, you know, you might want to pair it with. So it's who, who made it, where who they made, made it, it and when they made it and how uh, they made it and how they made it. And then you add a honey that was where it grew, when it grew, and how it was harvested, and how it was treated after harvest. And exactly. You put, and you put all of those together, and you're never going to get the same taste twice. Never. And there's like I said, like <laughs> there's no right or wrong with pairing honey with mm. cheese or pairing honey with any food. But there's some pairings that you might like a little bit better. But there's no right or wrong, and it's just a lot of fun. If you were going to pair a, a honey with with, well, let me give you two cheeses and and two general cheeses. <laughs> a, a, a real, a real. Oh, this is a test. <laughs> yeah, this is <laughs> no, because uh, because what I want people to do is that when they're done listening to this, I want I want them to sit down at their kitchen table and try this and and just see how it works. Uh, a honey, a good honey to go with blue cheese, and a good honey to go with a sharp cheddar. So, well, I mean, people at home, if they do have blue cheese or a cheddar or whatever they have in their fridge, they're probably going to have their own honey, or maybe they're going to have some nice samples that they bought or some local honey or, or something gourmet, maybe that they bought in the store. So for a blue cheese, I might go with something a little darker and stronger because of the robust intensity of the blue cheese. So you can go with a dark honey or a very strong honey, like a buckwheat or a, maybe an avocado honey. Or you can try a light honey, which might soften it. So you might go with a sage honey, a lighter, uh, like an acacia black locust honey. So it really depends. But at home, you're probably not going to have the kind of crazy selection that I have here. 
um, in my honey library. <laughs> uh, so, you know, for what was the other one? A cheddar? Did you dark, say? A dark cheddar. A, a, strong, a, dark cheddar? a, sharp, a sharp cheddar. So if you get a cheddar that's got a caramelly note, I always go with like a bamboo Japanese knotweed. I'm on the East Coast and we have a lot of knotweed here. So our fall honey tends to be dark. And it's got that maple y caramelly note, which I really love with cheddars because certain cheddars have that caramelly note. But mm. that's just me. But any honey that you have is going to be excellent. With some bread and maybe a glass of mead, you're all set for the evening. <laughs> or two. <laughs> or oh, yeah. two. <laughs> Jeff, have you ever tried any tried pairing anything with, with uh, any of the honeys that, that you've run across over the years? No, I actually I haven't. I, I've tried different honeys, of course. We all have. And and the thought of trying to pair, I, I'm I'm probably like so many other beekeepers, uh, you know, that uh, grew up with just hamburgers and, and uh, not a very sophisticated palate. So the whole idea of exploring the different honeys that I know that exist with different other food pairings is, is exciting. I mean, not exciting necessarily, but it's something I look forward to doing and, and thinking about. Yeah, and you travel around. So I think um, when you go to different parts of the United States, it's really a lot of fun to visit a farmer's market. Or if you're biking through a little rural neighborhood, you may stumble across a beekeeper that has a little farm stand. You can stop and pick up a bottle of that mm. honey, and it's a whole new uh, experience. Well, it, it adds to the fact oh, several years ago, uh, and and the the honey board, started promoting different honey varietals and varieties and, and trying to push that. And, and so I was aware of that through that effort, but the whole, yeah. the whole, and so I've always been aware of going through airports or going through, like you said, and seeing different, you know, Arizona honey or you know, whoever's honey. And, 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 uh, um, but I've never thought of saying, Hey, this would really, instead of just you sticking my finger in it and saying, Hey, this tastes great. Uh, doing that and saying, well, you know, this would really taste good with pumpkin pie or, you know, just coming up with a, uh, whatever it might taste good with. And I've never, I've never put one and one together to make two. So I think this, this is, so I told you I was going to enjoy this podcast, Kim. This is fun. Um, I, I'm hungry. I do admit, actually. I'm hungry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a good thing. <laughs> well, I'm, I have to say I'm a little bit of a honey geek. When I got into this about seven years ago, um, I just became so passionate and interested in all of these labors that on a you know, national and global scale, it is endless. So when people say, you know, what's your favorite honey? Well, what's my favorite honey this week? Because next week when I stumble upon something new, that's going to be my new favorite honey. So... Uh, I might be a little bit more uh, over the top than most people. Do you have Plus any? I'm a foodie. Well, that helps too. You you already have the the palate, as they say, for different flavors. Do so for beekeepers who are wanting to to experiment this with this and and or uh, try to find different types of honeys. As a taster, as a honey connoisseur, do you have tips for a beekeeper who's trying to? say, uh, separate and keep different types of honey based on what type of time of year he's pulling his honey or, or what, what's in bloom at any given time? Well, one of the things that can help people learn really quick is to actually taste different honey side by side in one sitting, which is something that we never really do. So if you have your own honey, you have a couple of different harvest of your own honey, and then you have some that are maybe store-bought or from your farmer's market, just to actually sit down with them and taste them side by side. Just, you know, honey number one, honey number two, and then in your mind, compare and contrast what you're experiencing. That's really the easiest way for people to start to really learn about how different honey is. And I do this a lot, not only in my classes, but just generally um, at you know, farmers markets and uh, different kinds of food events that I've been doing in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be doing bourbon and honey tasting <laughs> with somebody. How so I get mean, invited to that. Yeah, that's <laughs> <gonna say. laughs> you can have a, you can have a free ticket, but 
<laughs> you know, we're starting to see this emergence of people really exploring honey and pairing it up with other different artisan foods like bourbon or mead or cheeses. So it's really exciting time for honey is that people are really exploring how different the flavors are. And like I said, you can do this at home. Get yourself three, four, five honeys and just sit there and taste them and just think about them, enjoy them, do it with your friends and family over the holiday. Thanksgiving's coming up. You'll have, you know, all your friends and family there. And it's a lot of fun to just sit there and do that uh, and just have conversations. And and we're talking about more than just here's the 12 ounce bottle. We'll taste it out of that. And here's a 16 ounce bottle. We'll taste that. And here's a jar. We'll taste. You're talking about varieties too, right? Just. Yeah. Not drink it, but taste it. <laughs> <laughs> so in between, between flavors, between honeys, do you, do you drink water? Do you drink wine or how do you, or do you go from um, dark to light? You know, do you go? So for, you know, just for, you know, social fun, you know, you can have some bread, you can have some cheese. Like I said, you can have some wine. You know, you're doing it really for fun. But when we do the training, actually, in the classroom, the only thing that we let uh, people cleanse their palate with is water and uh, green apples. That's all they're allowed to do is to clean their palate with those two in between. Why green apples? Uh, It's just kind of a a neutral, sort of a sour, acidic um, palate cleanser, not lemon. Mm -hmm. And it's consistent. Yeah, one pretty things, much. One of the things, Jeff, you we've done here is, uh, believe it or not, even in the confines of Medina County and surrounding <laughs> close, is everybody bring in a jar, jar of honey and the variety that you get within 50 miles of each other is exceptional. They're all, many of them are similar, but somebody will bring in a fall, somebody will bring in a spring, so those are going to be different. But the summer honeys are going to be similar, but different just because of the mixes you get. The other thing I wanted to mention, uh, you brought up the National Honey Board. And uh, for people listening, if you're really serious about getting into different varieties of honey, the honey, National Honey Board on their webpage has the Honey Locator. And you can you can search people who are selling honey all over the U.S. that are selling all different kinds of honey. And two things. One is it gives you it gives you the opportunity to get some of these honeys. And the other one is, it gives you the opportunity to see if they know what they're talking about. Well, um, yeah, <laughs> but they have, they have international honeys as well. Yep. Their database is pretty big. And I did some work with the national honey board a couple of years ago. I was invited to attend a bunch of their summits and do honey tasting with the bakers and the chefs and the brewers. And that's a lot of fun. They brought in all uh, about 10 or 20 different varietals of honeys that we all got to taste together. Um, but what's really fun is that I've done some consulting with some of the larger honey companies and I've had the chance to sit down with their tasters and discuss what we think the varietal is. And to my surprise, we agreed on a lot of the honey. So that was kind of oh, nice. Good. Uh, just two things. Um, uh, Jeff, I want to throw this out. Sure. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Several years ago, I used to know the honey taster from Sue B, one of the fellows that worked for Sue B. And he could he could tell you the difference between sweet clover honey from Montana and sweet clover honey from Minnesota. Wow. And and he was that good. And he was he was that good. He he didn't miss a beat. The other thing is, Marina, we're running a, we're running short of time here. But I want you to t- can you tell us a little bit about red bee honey? What you do the rest of the day? So red bee honey is uh, my little honey business that I started. As most beekeepers know, this hobby gets a little bit out of hand, <laughs> and before you know it, it becomes a business where you've got to pay off your beekeeping hobby debts. (laughs) (laughs) So it started out with my own local honey in the farmer's markets. But then when I got bit by the honey bug, I decided that um, people were, people started asking me for honeys. Like they would come back from a vacation, maybe in the South of France. And they would say, do you have lavender honey? And I said, no, I, we don't really have lavender honey in Connecticut or on the East coast. So I would go out and I would try to find lavender honey for customers. So this kept happening. And then uh, the business has grown to the point now where I'm seeking out honey from 
from beekeepers that have just really interesting floral sources, depending upon where they're located and what the floral sources are in their area. I also started to dabble in some honeys from the EU, which are very actually exquisite honeys. So now we're growing and we're buying and selling just small quantities of different harvests that I can find that are really interesting flavor and actually things that taste like what they're supposed to taste like. So I have a lavender honey right now from Bulgaria that is just really, it's exquisite. The flavor is exquisite. It's very clean and it tastes like what it's supposed to taste like. So if I'm a gourmet chef in in Kansas City, Kansas, and I want some of that lavender honey, how do I find you? Well, you can go to the website and you can view all the honeys or you can email me. Let me know how much you have. I don't have a drum. <laughs> I have a couple of I have a couple pails here and there, and um, you know we can work something out. You got to pay for shipping though. We'll have that contact information on the web page, won't we, Jeff? Yeah, you bet. We'll have uh, actually okay. we'll have the uh, link to the Red Bee Honey. We'll have the link to the uh, American Honey Tasting Society and also the National Honey Board in there. Um, their site. Excellent. Excellent. Marina, this has been really fun. It's been way, way too short, but uh, I've even, after knowing you all of these years and having worked with you this much, I'm still learning something today. So that tells me that you're doing a good job. Uh, any last words? Oh, thank you for having me. It's really great to speak to you and about our favorite subject, honey. <laughs> there you go. All right. Well, it's Jeff, been... I think that about wraps it up for today. Yeah. Uh, Marina, I really appreciate you being uh, joining us today and, and uh, look forward to maybe having Thanks. you back. I think we, there's a lot more there to discuss. Yeah. Thank you for having me. A pleasure to meet you. Nice meeting you too. All right. Well, thanks a lot. That was really fun talking to Marina today, Kim. I uh, learned quite a bit about, uh, a little bit more about honey and, and the, the how, how you can approach honey as more than just a spread or an ingredient, but just really on its own basis of the flavor and, and how you can go about doing that. Yeah, I, I had a lot of fun today, Jeff. I got to tell you, um, it, it's been a while since I've had a chance to chat with Marina, just kind of one-on-one, if you will. And, and, and it reminded me again why I enjoyed so much writing that book with her, uh, The Honey Connoisseur. But I got to tell you, it's, since it's been a while since I've chatted with her, she, she has continued to grow and uh, to expand her world and thus, fortunately for us, our world on, on the exotic, in my opinion, the exotic world of people who taste for a living, olive oil and wine and now honey, yeah. and her experiences in Italy and her experiences here. And then you add all of that to the world of cheese that she does. <laughs> and and I got to tell you, we have an article this month. This is going to be the December 2018 issue of Bee Culture magazine um, that she talks about honeys and cheese, pairing honeys and cheeses. And I got that article, of course, a while back. We had to have it ready for publication. And I just took that book home or that story home. And I just sat down. I went to the grocery store and I got five or six kinds of cheeses. And two. I have two. Actually, I have probably 20 kinds of honey sitting on my <laughs> cupboard at home. I see a one few of, the, of them behind you on your desk. Uh, yes, in the so <laughs> one of the joys of my job is when I go someplace, often people say, here, try my honey. Right. And I do. Um, so I was, I've been trying different kinds of honeys with different kinds of cheeses and everything that she said was right. And then you take the next step, uh, past honeys and cheeses and just the, the sensory, uh, experience of tasting honey. You mentioned it here just a second ago of how you experience the flavors and the aromas and the taste and, and all of that. And I, I just hope what we were able to get to people today, Jeff, is to open that door. Um, I mean, she's been doing this for 20 years. Mm-hmm. I've been doing it for 10. You've been doing it for about two weeks. And, <laughs> and, and, and I know that I don't know, not, I don't know one iota of what she does and she's still learning. So I hope we've been able to open the door for people to try this, to experience it, and then to share it with some of their customers, because 
we've got a product, we beekeepers have a product unlike anything else on the planet. And I think we should be sharing it a lot more. And Marina and her book, The Honey Connoisseur, is the way to experience all of that, to learn it, to teach it, and to do it. So I'm glad we were able to do this today, Jeff. I'm glad you were able to come along for the ride. And uh, <clears throat> belated Marina, thank you. Absolutely. To sum it all up, I mean, the Honey Board presented a couple years ago, the honey varietals are just phenomenal, and, and beekeepers can market those and, and should really push those as something beyond just clover honey. You know, what is it about the honey that's uh, remarkable? And if we take what we learned from Marina today and through the book that you and her wrote um, and are able to pr produce that or, or produce honey and market it that way, uh, I think you could probably sell more of it more successfully and at a higher price. I think if anything else, Jeff, this may be a good place to say wildflower honey, rest in peace. Let's get <laughs> rid of wildflower honey. That's right. All right. Well, catch you next time, Jeff. All right. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.